Okay. All right. Okay. Good day. Good day, mate. Here we are, um, back on Wisdom is Bliss, um, giving a kind of oral commentary on my book, um, which is sort of my latest one of Dharma teaching, summarizing and making practical as I possibly can <clears throat> all of the three vehicles of the Buddha Dharma, and um, in, I think, a new way. So the title of the book is, uh, just to repeat, Wisdom is Bliss. Wisdom is the bliss, not ignorance, that is. Wisdom is the bliss. And four friendly fun facts that can change your life. Friendly fun fact is my translation of a noble truth. And so there are four of those, which is the framework of the teaching. Harking back to the original time when Buddha gave that teaching to the five ascetics in Sarnath near Varanasi, near Benares in India. And... Um, We've reached, I think, and I, and I apologize if because there have been gaps between my recording of these things, I keep repeating some things. Maybe I, I don't know if I've already gone over some of this, but never mind because you need to go over it quite a lot because uh, it's very important and it's very part of her life. And, you know, people might think, well, Buddhism is just meditating, you don't have to learn anything. And of course, one of the one of the main things about the teaching is that's not correct. That one does have a lot to learn, and that is a meditation. And learning learning from life all the time is meditation, and learning from your mind. And then in between, you also do seated learning and meditating things that can deepen your learning. That's what it's for. So, but if you meditate without learning anything, then you're just deepening however you already see things. So as what is famous uh, Hermes Trismegistus, I think, famous uh, saying, show me your beginning and I'll show you your end. You know, wherever you start from, that's where you're going to end up. So the point is, you want to always change your starting point. And um, we're still in that chapter of changing the starting point, which is the first branch of the eightfold friendly fun fact path, the fourth friendly fun fact, which is the Eightfold Path, and <clears throat> which is the means of achieving the nirvana that we want to achieve, live, we want to achieve, we want to achieve as our object and our target of meditation, and it's the nirvana that it comes with Buddhahood, with enlightenment. So it's the nirvana which means when you fall in love with the entire universe, that's what we're aiming for, right? And Or rather, maybe we could put it this way, where you discover that life is being in love with the entire universe. That's what life is. The life force is the force of love. Uh, that's what we may discover. And Buddhism has not been taught that way, and it should be. That's what I'm having to say. That's what wisdom is bliss has to say, because, of course, love comes. Love means you want the beloved to be happy. The real love is not the greed that you want the beloved to love you. That, of course, we do want that, selfishly, but that's a little bit, that's desire, that's greed. Whereas love is just we want the other to be happy. We want the beloved to be happy. We want the world to be, be well, to be better, you know, type of thing. And that's what our life force is, actually. That's what we discover it already is. And when we fully know that, we become a Buddha. That's, that's what a, we blossom into Buddhahood, you know. It isn't just awakening, and it isn't just being enlightened. It's blossoming into what we really most truly can be as a human being, as a deity, as whatever kind of animal we might be. Okay? So, and what do Buddhas do? How do Buddhas help us? Well, they can't save us by themselves. They can't make us blossom. It's like if you're a gardener, you, do, you can't make the flower blossom, like pull, it, pull the seed and, with pincers or something turn it into petals. You can't do that. It has to blossom on its own, according to its own development. But what you can do is have the right soil, the right moisture, the right temperature, the right, the right fertilizer, the right whatever it is. You can make it the best conditions as a coach, and you can coach that rose bush to have the beautiful rose blossom. You know, But you can't force it to blossom. It has to blossom itself. Right, it has the potential to do it, 
and it has to discover that it can do it. So similarly, Buddha, as I, I'm beginning here, and I apologize if this is repetitive of one of the previous sessions, but in a way it's all right because it drums it in, you know, because actually everything is very simple to learn and know and understand. It isn't difficult to know what life is because you are alive. So in a way, you're, you're, if your mind doesn't know it, because if your concept tells you that you can't or that you, you're not able to or something, your body knows it, your health knows it, your feeling of inner joy knows it, those are the life forces. And they know it. And you just have to discover what they already know. You know, like different cells in your hand know it because they love each other, meaning they interconnect with each other and they, they enhance the life of each other. If any cell starts growing at the, by destroying the life of another, that's called a cancer cell. And that's the death force, not a life force. Life force is union, is connecting. Death force is separating, dissolving. Okay? That's clear. So anyway, there's this wonderful statement by a great Indian poet named Matucheta, uh, or sometimes known, uh, or it's controversial whether he's the same as someone called Ashwagosha. Ashwagosha means the sound of a horse. So it's a teacher who is like so happy and triumphant that they're like, <laughs> they're like whinnying. Their teaching is like a horse's whinny, Ashwagosha, great poet of ancient India. But before he became Ashwagosha, he was someone called Matucheta, one who respects his mother, which is already good, you know, was already great. And when he, he was first an opponent of the Buddhists, he thought they were no good. And then he uh, had a debate with the famous Arya Deva, a disciple of Nagarjuna. And then he realized Arya Deva really had, it was not just trying to dominate him by argument, but was trying to get him to see where he was a little bit making a mistake and where he could see deeper. And when he realized that, then he became very devoted to the enlightening teaching. And so he's, and then he wrote a poem about it, and he said, well, what I like about Buddhas is they do not uh, bless away others' pain by laying on of hands. That's not what they do. Some There are healers who can do that, but that's not Buddha's thing. Nor do they wash away their sins with cleansing water, nor do they just sort of baptize them or purify them with water. Well, there are priests who do do that, but that's not what Buddhas mainly do. And most importantly, they don't transmit their realization into others' minds. And this is a wrong thing people get to a lot, you know, with initiations and guru relationships and so forth. They think somehow the guru plants the, his own enlightenment or her own enlightenment into your mind. But that would be body snatching. You know? That would be invading your mind. Rather, the guru actually is there to coach you to discover what is the deepest place of your mind, your own good heart, or your own warm-hearted kindness and wisdom connect, wisdom of connection and union and interconnecting with beings and life. And to that's the guru's role is to help bring out within you what you already have deep, but you have it buried under all kinds of paranoias and confusions and mistaken concepts from your culture and so on. So they don't, they don't pretend to transmit their realization into others' minds because that, the person, we would, resist, we would refuse having someone else's mind be our mind. But it respects each of us as an individual. That's, why, that's the way we connect. We connect in a way of mutual uh, by love, where the other connects, we connect to the other who wants to love us to be ourselves. We want them to be themselves and to be truly happy. That's what love is. It isn't greed, okay? Finally, what do they do? They free beings by showing them their own reality. So that's the thing. They, they display to them, they mirror to them their real reality, and that's a very complicated job of a teacher. Of a, it's kind of of a coach, you know. You can't go and make the touchdown yourself, but you can coach the players to go and make the touchdown. And they can do better when they accept your coaching. Right? They also do it on their own ultimately, but then you help them. Okay? The main point is that the realistic worldview melts all absolutisms into emptiness. You know, this word I use as if you know what it is. And I hope you do. Absolutism means to make something into an absolute. Like, you know, you think, well, like, which we do unconsciously. Like this table in front of me, 
is a relative object. But to me, it has a kind of, and in many thousands of years of Western philosophers, and even some Indian ones, <laughs> I think there's an essence in the table that is where its real absolute tableness comes from. So when I see it as a table, it's sort of, it's an absolutely is that object a table. It's not any other thing. Whereas good modern observing science would say, well, it looks like a table at a certain level of, of focus, but you could have an X-ray machine. We'll go right through it. It will be see the empty go through the empty spaces in the atoms that make up the cells of wood that make up the table, and then who knows finally what is the atom, what it's made of. In other words, that it it has a it has a relational reality within a certain context, but it's not an absolute. Is the point absolute? Actually, it's the opposite of relative. So if the table was absolute, I couldn't contact it. It couldn't be. It couldn't stand on the floor. It couldn't be made of some substance. It's, it wouldn't be relational. Absolute means it's kind of stands all by itself, in it in, in its essence. And that's that's what we do to make it sort of convenient at first, in the sense that we sort of glance at a wall. We say, "Oh, that's a wall," and the wall seems to have a massive objectivity about it. And so we, that is our unconscious absolutizing of the wall, if you will. It's making it into a thing in itself. Whereas actually the wall is purely relational, purely contextual. It's not a wall to Superman who can see through it. It's not a wall to an X-ray machine that can go through it. Cosmic ray can go through it. It's, it's not, it's not, it, it doesn't notice it, actually. It goes right through it. Okay. So the realistic worldview doesn't give you x-ray vision right away, but it makes you realize that there's something you and the wall are interacting in a certain way, and you are constructing the wall to be a, in a certain way, which is useful for you, but it's still relational, and it can be something else. And for example, everyone discovers this when you fall asleep. When you fall asleep, you give up your sense field, so you go blank, kind of. When you die, you lose your sense organs of your body, and you realize that they were only a construct in a certain context, and you're there as a, as an unconscious mind, and then you begin to have dreams and things, a dreamlike between state, according to the investigations of the Indian and Tibetan reporters, scientists, explorers, who explored that, that world through space and time. So the main point, therefore, the realistic worldview simply undoes the concept and the unconscious instinct that wants to make an absolute out of whatever it encounters. And emptiness means really the freedom from being absolutely what it seems to be. So it's an emptiness, it means really it's a negation, it means it's empty of what it seems, of, of being absolutely fixed, as what it seems to be absolutely fixed as, put it that way. So it's a sort of the freedom of everything, everything is free. Everything is transformable. Everything is relatable. That's what it, that's what freedom does. It makes you realize the relationality of everything. Once you realize emptiness and or freedom, you are compelled to learn to surf the causalities of the relative world around you, toward both your own realization of the wisdom of nirvana, joyful freedom, and your compassionate purpose to include others within it because you are someone who is seeking that for everybody, not just for yourself. Of course, you want you include yourself in everybody, but you want to bring everyone else with you into that joy, as you naturally do. When you're really happy, aren't you automatically wishing people around you to be happy, share your good vibe, see them smile, smile at them? You know, you have a special sense of when you see them kind of looking, looking sad or uptight, you know, you automatically want to like touch their shoulder or give them a hug or give them a smile to relax and, and reassure them. So you naturally do that. That's your Buddhahood right there. That's your loving, kind nature. So that's how you surf it and your compassionate purpose to include others within it. This happens naturally because the realization automatically opens you to identifying with all others by sort of loosening the fixity of your identifying with yourself so that you sort of 
identify with yourself in a certain mood, but you're, you, you become like a transparent to your own self. You don't land somewhere and then clutch that. You identify by just feeling you're, you are yourself. And so then that you automatically then can identify with others, which is what love makes you do, because that's what makes you want them to be happy so much. You, emp you become empathic to them. You feel their feelings and identify with them in that way. And so your own realization doesn't separate you from them. There are realizations where you will feel that you and them and everything around you dissolves into open space. You can have a realization like that. And that will give you a rush for a time being. But actually, that's not the final state. The final state is where you're in a, you're a new way because you, because you realize the openness and the spaciousness and the also perpetuity of things, the, the, the temporal space, if you will, like space-time. You know, they were in space-time long before Einstein, the ancient people, the, the ancient Indian Enlightenment seekers. And <clears throat> so... You you in that more open thing, and then you feel more intimately connected with others. So it doesn't separate from them, and so it must include them. The bliss of nirvana eternally and perpetually includes everyone and everything, and so you find you are all you are all reality, melting into this infinite eternal space time reality identity with everything, through total inexhaustible immutable bliss that automatically enfolds all others as well. And uh, that's the a, that's a Buddhism experience. Another way to think of the relative worldview, they call it the great seal experience. Another way to the great embrace is like you embrace the whole universe. You melt into it, it melts into you. Another way to think of the realistic worldview is that you're here forever. And you have to be concerned not just with your old age and your pension, but with your next life and the ones hereafter. The way to be concerned with your next life is to invest now in your higher mind and get your mind open and clear. Practice and meditate on generosity, for example. That's the original opening thing. In Allen Ginsberg's wonderful little song, poem that he wrote called How to Meditate, I'm going to sing about how to meditate. And then he had the refrain of it was, generosity, generosity, generosity. So it was surprising if you think about it. People think meditating, you're kind of sitting there withdrawing from everything. And that is a certain type of meditating, but not the most important one. The most important meditation are the opening ones. Then the meditation that you do in daily life is where you have something you like, you love. Like I have this little meditation gong this Tibetan thing to help meditate, the wonderful nice gong I have, and uh, and I like it, and it's mine, you know. But if I give it to somebody, that's opening my clutch on it, my identifying with it, and it's uh, it, and it's allowing me to share the joy of making it ring with someone else, and that's an opening, and so that's a meditation in life. And we're doing, all of us are doing that all the time. We're meditating to be more clutchy and more grabby and greedy, or we're meditating being more open. And mentally we give, give things, you know. We share things and so forth. So that's why he made that very wisely, Alan did. He made that his, his refrain of the how to meditate was generosity, generosity. So practice and then meditate on generosity. Give something to somebody a little bit especially something you like. That's the best kind of offering. That which you already like, you give away because you assume other people will like it. Don't overdo it, of course. Don't push so far past your habits that every time you see that other person with that thing you gave to them, you regret. You say, oh, why did I give them that thing? I liked it so much. Now, don't overdo it. Remember Bill Murray's famous precepts, baby steps, baby steps. In that great movie, What About Bob? You know, where he walked around carrying his goldfish with him, set with him for the weekend in a plastic bag <laughs> to put it in a bowl where he got when he got somewhere. Baby steps, baby steps. Little by little, bit by bit. Share your muso chocolate. Don't take the last three bites. Have the first three bites and then just give it. Don't give the whole thing away and then watch with annoyance as the other person slobbers it up and enjoys it. Enjoy it a bit yourself. 
and then enjoy them enjoying it. That's the key. Once you have that realistic worldview, and you realize you are a precious continuum of good energy, still dragging along some bad energy that encloses you and blocks you and is sort of lurks behind you in your instinct and your unconscious. Your job as a human is to take this unique opportunity to really increase the good experientially, exponentially, and really decrease the bad exponentially. One example of someone who was able to adopt a realistic worldview and exponentially increase the good was my teacher, my beloved Keshi Wangyal La, Tanji Ledu Tsene Mete, Tsene Mete. He asked me to say whatever I mentioned his name after he passed away, to always say I mentioned his name for a purpose. And that's considered a very polite thing to do in Tibet. Since when a great person dies, actually, really, when any person, because all people are great, actually, but when anybody dies, a little bit of them is still around you always, and not necessarily as a ghost. They may already be reborn, but they are bigger than any one body, all human beings are. And so, and they're around, and when you mention their name, they it attracts their attention. So they don't want to be called on all the time, because they might be more focused on wherever they are in their next life. So you say, I mentioned the name for a purpose. Anyway, my beloved Geshe Wangyal La led me into the heart of the Tibetan language, itself a divine and magical creation. And there, that's this wonderful story about the guy. Because Tibetan, like Burmese, is a sort of monosyllabic language, like Chinese, but it's not the same family as Chinese. It's a different one within that kind of language. But in a way, they would have been more logical to write it with Chinese characters, therefore with ideograms, you know, rather than with an alphabet, with syllables, you know, and phonetically. Because if there's many one-syllable words, so therefore three or four word ma can mean a horse, can mean a mother, it can mean a negation, it can mean all different kinds of things. And, and you differentiate it by context in the language and by tone, how you say ma, 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 ma. In Chinese, there's four main tones, but generally there's an intuitive element in those kind of monosyllabic languages, but they didn't want to write it in Chinese because in that time, in the 7th century of the Common Era, the Tibetans wanted to write in a way where they could translate syllabic languages, and namely from India, Sanskrit, Prakrit, the different Indian, Bengali, you know, the different kinds of Indian languages, so as to have the sort of more precision of verb cases and, and the declensions of verbs and cases of nouns and you know the, the modification of language that you can you can transmit in a polysyllabic, you know what they call inflected language that's written in an alphabet. But how to make a monosyllabic type of language fit into an alphabet was complicated. So then the Bodhisattva of wisdom of science, Manjushri, had to come and inspire them, uh, like Shiva did for the Sanskrit grammar in the Shiva Sutras, you know, inspire the great grammarians to make a beautiful system that will enable people to exchange learning and to create culture and so forth, the wonderful, magical thing that language is, you know. So anyway, so Wandjala, he led me into the heart of the Tibetan language itself, a divine and magical creation, that's what I meant by that. And I can't, you know, in a book you can't give every story, you know, but I can in my commentary and gave me the keys to this emptiness relativity tolerance equation. Isn't that wonderful, you know? Freedom means not that you go and isolate yourself in some, you don't get trapped in freedom. You don't have to fear freedom. Freedom means you can relate freely. You can openly relate. You can relate much more better by empathizing with everything and everyone and by identifying with it all. You become like a cloud type of being, who you like a field being, where you are the whole field around you. You're kind of responsible, and you share your you you spread your pleasure at being alive to the whole field around you, whether that includes other beings or it includes plants or it includes beautiful things. That's a way in which you're more more vividly alive. So he gave me the, that's the emptiness relativity tolerance equation. A simple, unassuming man, I'm referring to Geshe again, he preferred to tend the flowers in his garden in the gentle hills near the Delaware, 
where he lived in his elder age, it was retreat center, shunning a highly merited acclaim in the forums of philosophy in Tibet, India, or America, because he was the most profound philosophical genius I have ever encountered, from the little bit I was able to recognize in those days of my stubborn, you know, arrogant uh, 20-year-old uh, persona. Philosophy is no mere... He exemplifies for me the central fact that heartfelt philosophy is no mere word game, but is the ground of a life of purpose, transformation, ultimately sheer joy, tolerance in little things, and selfless effort in the bigger ones. His daytime garden was lush and beautiful in his later days, with roses and peonies and bright orange tiger lilies, and he was never happier than when he carefully watered them in the cool of the late afternoon. But for me, his most wonderful garden is ever, to borrow the Tibetan Buddhist master Tsongkhapa's exquisite metaphor, the night lily garden of the treatises of Nagarjuna. And there, that's a, you know, if, you know, if Jesus' symbolic flower is the rose, Nagarjuna, the great philosopher and, and saint of India, his flower is a special kind of white lily that grows at night with moon rays that, that, that exist in India. In other words, most flowers bloom with the sun rays. You know, the, the bud opens when the rays of the sun warm it. But this particular night lily opens when the moon rays coolly open it. And it's a metaphor for the blossoming of the understandings from Nagarjuna's fantastic teaching of freedom, emptiness, and compassion, indivisible. In other words, the divine song of the awakened mind that comes as a result of a realistic worldview. So that finishes that chapter, and it comes to the next one, but it doesn't finish us, I think, quite yet. Uh, we still go on a little bit, so we start into the next one which is called, which is the second uh, lane of the Eightfold Path that we then expand our vehicle to run in the two lanes. When you move from one to another, you don't leave the realistic worldview. The realistic worldview gives you access to the next lane. It expands your vehicle as you go, which is the best kind of education. Best kind of education isn't just feeding information or skills into a fixed persona. It expands the persona so it expands the subjectivity of the being that learns. They learn more about themselves. They become more capable of learning the next thing. So, so the Eightfold Path is like that. It's like an eight-lane highway where once you master one lane and the foundational one is to shift your worldview, which doesn't mean you completely understand your worldview. It's just your view. It's like a belief, a view. But you give it, it becomes your target for for experiential understanding. It is experiential to know it rationally, but then beyond that, you your rationality goes down and it and it it opens up the inner irrationality of your instincts, of your self-centered instincts, and it opens you deep more deeply. And that's of course where meditation eventually will get to the meditation lane. And we'll get to the mindfulness lane, but those are the seventh and eighth lanes. You have to you, all this, all this other stuff is the learning setup, which is really important in the, in the fourth friendly fun fact of the path, right? So the second one, the second lane now is the motivation, meaning life motivation or life purpose. So what is the purpose of your life? Once your worldview is realistic, once you accept the evolutionary causality of mind, as well as speech and body, but mind most subtly, and thus are aware of both the danger of letting it go in the wrong direction toward greater forms of suffering, and the opportunity to make it go in the right way toward greater happiness and bliss for both self and other, then you are motivated to find the shortest, quickest way to the best, the unexcelled supreme good. Your realistic motivation, simply put, is to become fully awake, fully enlightened, and bl fully blossomed as a, as a heart-centered, intelligence-centered being, love-centered being, okay? When I was younger, I remember feeling alienated from my family, friends, and schoolmates. 
I knew I had a special purpose, but no one could help me find out what it was. Others tried to impose what they thought it should be according to what they thought I was and who I should be. But I felt like a stranger in a strange land, to quote the title of Robert Heinlein's well phone sci fi well well what is it? Well known. Yeah, well known sci fi book. You know, sci fi is very, very important to increase your imagination of the possibilities of life. It's really a it's really a Buddha teaching. It really is. Enlightening teaching, awakening teaching, sci fi. I love it. Now as Ganden, my perceptive eldest son who's blessed purpose of this life ever goes mysteriously beyond mine, eventually said, quote, Somehow, wherever we are, we are always wandering in exile. He says to say, I think we were in Europe at the time, or we were maybe in India, we were maybe we were in New York City, I don't know. But he said, we always feel like we're wandering in exile. We're looking at going down the street. Maybe it is because I was born and raised in New York City, Manhattan Island, even. itself an island in sort of a concrete exile from the earth, except for the blessed Central Park. Both of my parents were nominal, non-church-going, for the most part, Protestant Christians. My father had a soft spot for St. Francis, but did not go to church. My mother's Bible was the collected works of Shakespeare, which is actually interesting because, you know, Shakespeare was writing in the time they were doing the King James Version of the Bible approximately the same time. And uh, and um, when, they, when they hired various rabbis escaping from Spain in Elizabethan England, and, um, and they had to force convert or be forced to convert or pretend to convert to Christianity, but uh, which, they, for their point of view, was the teaching of a rabbi of their own. So it wasn't too bad for them, actually, in one way. But another way, they had to be secret about their own Shabbos and their own rituals, you know. And uh, <clears throat> But anyway, so it's similar to the Bible, you know. But that was her Bible, was works of Shakespeare. I personally never had much love for the God concept when I was young, probably from the very time I was born, according to my mother. And now I, I do tell this story. When I was ordained as a Buddhist monk, and eventually returned from India and visited my mother in New York, coming from my local monastic home in New Jersey. She said to me, I should have realized you would become a Buddhist. When you were a baby and I took you to our brick church to be baptized, you were so disturbed and upset that you kicked wildly in your long white gown and knocked over the baptismal font and, and drenched the priest. He was so embarrassed and discomfited that he just wrung a few drops out from his soaked cassock on your flailing feet and counted that as your baptism. <laughs> you were resisting the church from the beginning, she said to me. Although actually, thanks to the Lama, I should just say, that is a true story. And I'm trying to tell this to kind of give you a sense of my sense of my previous life which I didn't even have the concept about when I felt like I was a stranger of a strange land. You know, I didn't even think about a former life at all, you know. But I obviously had affinities from a former life, is what I'm saying. And later I remember what they were, what what they were like. But I didn't at this time. But, but, I, but I just want to say, well, I may have resisted it then, but later the Dalai Lama taught me to really love the Christian church, and I do. And I love Jesus. And I like it. But I don't like the misappropriation of it, of course, to domineer people the way that, and to convert everybody to their dogmas and things that I don't like. But they don't, that's not the essence of their thing. The essence of the thing is a wonderful, good, communal, friendly community feeling. And a feeling that there are loving beings in the universe who are there to try to help them from all their problems and obstacles and bad consequences from their bad deeds. I like that. Although, don't make him do too much. He did say he wasn't going to rescue the people who were really bad. And even though they would be bad in his name, he said, no, then, then I don't know you. And I won't recognize you, he said. He did say that to get them to take responsibility. A few years ago, at one of the Dalai Lama's talks, when he said he didn't want people to convert from their birth religion to Buddhism as a religion, I reassured him from my seat next to his translator, very rude of me, I interrupted. 
that I had not converted from Christianity to Buddhism, but instead had added being a sort of a Buddhist to being a reason yogi seeker, a seeker using philosophical reason as my yoga. That's what I did. And I was a sort of a Buddhist because I remain a reason, reason yogi, rational yogi, trying to be reasonable anyway. In fact, Buddhist science ultimately taught me to make more interest in Christianity as well as in all other long-serving religions. Thanks to His Holiness, I now really love Jesus and Mary, and in addition Confucius, the Shekinah and Moses, Radha and Krishna and Shankara of the non-dualist version of Buddhism, of Hinduism, Lhasa, and I even now like the monistic version. I like the, the theistic version of Hinduism and all these are good tra 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 traditions. Lao Tzu and Taoism, of course, and Islam, starting with the great Muhammad himself and his consorts, Khadija, Ayesha, and then especially his Sufi successors like Attar, Ibn Arabi, and the amazing Rabia of Basra, a woman, you know. I can have a woman Sufi. I can even get along with Gdeh. Gd, that's written G dash D. I love that the Jewish sages gave Gd a name, Y H W H, Y, without vowels, so it cannot be pronounced, being on guard against their own arrogance of trying to control things by calling out their names. You know, if you have a name for God that you can call out, then you can sort of feel you can summon. So you give your own ego a kind of power that, you know, you're the, the, the God is behind you because I know his name, you know. And so those traditions that make God ineffable, unpronounceable, unnameable are, are maybe more realistic and wonderful. Although one wonderful mystical uh, Jewish friend of mine told me that the YHWH means that the Y is the inhalation and the W is the exhalation, and the ha 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 is the breath. So Y H W H means that just breathing, you're infusing with God, you know, inhaling and exhaling. So God is everything, in other words, kind of wonderful pantheistic vision at the heart of Judaism. I love that. Okay, so when I first read the Buddhist teacher Nagarjuna's deep explanation of Shakyamuni Buddha's four noble truths, four friendly fun facts. They hit me vis viscerally. Each noble truth or fun fact, which I, or friendly fact, I call it, was completely on target. I immediately realized that these four noble or friendly truths were my exact prescription for a cure, a fitting conclusion of my pilgrim seeker's journey to the East that ended up via India to reaching New Jersey <laughs> via India just an hour or two west of Manhattan. <laughs> because uh, I did find my first teacher all a, a two-hour bus, or hour and a half bus ride west of Manhattan, of the, of the Port Authority bus terminal. The purpose, I flew all the way, I hitchhiked, actually, all the way to India and walked and hiked like a fakir uh, all the way to India and then had to fly back for a funeral and then I met my first teacher, great teacher, I mean, first teacher that I recognized as a teacher, spiritual teacher. Actually, my mother was a spiritual teacher. My father was. Life is our spiritual teacher, finally, of course. But the good person is really special, too. The purpose of a human life, the guru, you know, the purpose of a human life, it became clear to me, is to attain that perfect freedom, that summum bonum, Latin for the highest good, Imagine what a bad situation it is when a culture imprisons its members' aspirations by instilling in them a sense that there is no such thing as a summit of good. Just survival from meal to toilet to meal, waking to sleeping to dreaming to waking, from birth to death, and finally to nothing. <laughs> That's a materialist way. The Indo-Tibetan Buddhist science and civilization opened the door for me to a life purpose that suited my instinct that there is such a supreme good and that compared to it, 
no lesser life goal is worthwhile. And that's why, you know, in India, in ancient Buddha's time, and then in Tibet, when this tradition moved there, people, when they would really understand, even they get that realistic worldview, they would automatically want to become a full-time traveler of the Eightfold Path. And the optimal way to do that would be supported by livelihood for just doing, just like learning. So lifelong fellowship, lifelong scholarship. And the way of getting lifelong scholarship in that generous surplus possessing society of ancient wealthy, agriculturally wealthy India was to become a mendicant, uh, a mendicant seeker where the generosity of the society would give you a free lunch. And you did a free brunch, actually, because you had to eat it before noon. You had to beg it and eat it every day before noon. And not dinner, and not breakfast, just brunch. And not to overstrain the generosity of the society. But that's what you would do. So that's why I felt, because of my previous life, I think, in a country that doesn't really respect monastics, maybe a great writer like Thomas Merton, but generally... Protestant ethic-driven Buddhist society where you have to be productive in some economic way to be respected. They don't respect people who are mendicants, that is to say, they want a free brunch, they want free land, they want exemption from military service, they want exemption from taxation, they want exemption from the duties of raising a family, because they just want to put their whole life into that. And the society, the intelligent Buddha picked the intelligent Indian and the wealthy and intelligent Indian society because he realized that's where the generosity would be that would support a community of seekers who, in a sense, were worthless in productivity terms, it would seem to the authorities. For example, Confucius, who visited China at that time, he completely fit with that culture where they said they don't want, to, they don't want any yogis, they don't want mystics, they don't want people who say, well, I, just, I'll, I will starve to death or I won't eat anything because I'm going to just meditate, I'm going to just practice, I'm going to just deepen my understanding of the universe full time, and I'm not going to do any rote or routine activities. And Confucius said, no way, we're not even going to feed that person because they didn't have the economy to do it. So he catered to that more Protestant ethic or Confucian ethic society. At the same time, Chakyamuni Buddha was able to create the huge community of mendicants that transformed India, his sort of army of seekers of awakening and enlightenment. The very highest good becomes defined within infinite space and time, or space-time, as perfect awakening and enlightenment, which is perfect Blossoming, being Buddha, being blissful, happiness, overflowing outward as love and compassion, and art through, also through art that enfolds all the living in the golden light of the abundant fulfillment and joy. That's what artists do. They make us happy. They sing. They dance. They do like Taylor Swift. They paint a beautiful painting to make us see a field of haystacks and corn and sunflowers in a new way as, as, a, as a seat of, as a blissful space rather than just some sort of agricultural thing. But that's the golden light of abundant fulfillment and joy is what Van Gogh made available to us. <clears throat> and, uh, you, know, my, you know, Michelangelo's David and so on. It is the summit of the Indus to make us see a human being as a beautiful being. It is the summit of the individual's evolutionary struggle, the loving drive to become a being of perfect freedom, perfect bliss, perfect wisdom, and perfect love, and the power to make it so for everyone else, past, present, and future, as well as for oneself, including oneself, but also making everyone happy. That's what the artist wants to do. I mean, they maybe the more, the, you know, the beginning one is really just does it because it makes them happy. But then one of the reasons it makes them so happy is because they notice that other beings are happy when, they, when they're exposed to that art. And then also there are arts that are not formal arts. There's the art of culture. There's the art of cooking. There's the art of feeding people. There's the art of 
greeting them. There's the art of smiling at them. There's the art of of uh, building things for them and so forth. You know, so there are many many ways that you share your love with beings. As ever, the main revelation of the four friendly fun facts or noble truths is the third one, the end of suffering, the freedom from suffering, which is what you really can have. You really will not suffer again. Please don't believe those people who tell you that enlightenment is just being able to bear up on the suffering. It's going to be the same old suffering and that now you'll just sort of welcome it or something. No, it is not the same old suffering. You know, in a way, your empathy makes you be aware of what other beings are having as the same old suffering. But that becomes intolerable to you through your empathy and your compassion, which is driven by your bliss. So you're focused on the bliss. You may note that they are feeling the suffering. Or even maybe if something bumps into you, you might note that there should be a feeling of a bump, a bump on your leg, but it doesn't disturb your bliss, actually. Real Buddhahood is able, therefore, to immensely empathize with infinite numbers of sensitive beings because while they fully they, they experience the suffering empathically for the beings as the beings, they themselves keep a current, a lightning bolt, a, like a, a, a cloud of bliss that completely relieves that suffering. It, it it instantly relieves it. So in a way, they they both do and they don't feel it because they never lose the bliss. And the fact that they are like that while being fully united with the being that is thinking they're having same old suffering or even worse and worse, that's the one thing that provides an energy, a field, a vibe that gives an ingredient to that being that's in the suffering that gives them some at least feeling that they can go within their heart and find inner relief, which will then make them feel that they will be able to get full relief and will heal. And it's that placebo effect, it's that bedside manner, multiplied and magnified to the nth degree. But again, you can't force that flower to blossom. You can't force that future to overtake the present for the other, necessarily. It has to be felt by them that they have the time, they have the space and time to do it. And that becomes your skill as a teacher, as an artist. So they have, But the third of the truth, the nirvana, is the one which is the prognosis for healing our illness of misknowing, our suffering and pain and illness of misknowing. There is a real nirvana, a real blowing away, and such a free bliss nirvana is and always has been the actual reality of life and death, and our life and death. It's always been that. But when we don't know it, because we make up something that isn't that, we misknow it, uh, then we suffer. But we now realize, when we fully understand it, on the other hand, when we fully know it, we will know and experience life as bliss realizing that our previous suffering was only in error, not totally unreal, but ultimately illusory. This nirvana, if it was, if it was to, just totally unreal, we'd be isolated from those who are still suffering, and we would have no compassion. But that's not nirvana. That's itself another relational state that one has to sort of fuse together, like fusion cooking, <laughs> fuse it together with the previous miserable, unknowing state, misknowing state. So we realize that our previous suffering is only an error, but, uh, but not totally unreal, but ultimate illusory. This nirvanic reality is still portrayed unrealistically by some dualistic Buddhist traditions, the religious ones, as being a state outside of, elsewhere from the world, a real state apart from the seemingly equally real world of suffering. In fact, that notion of a radically other nirvana is simply the irrational mistaking of a relative state where you can withdraw from uh, and go into an inner space and time beyond feeling with your coarse senses your your environment. But it's mistaken, that, but it's still a relative state. It's a state of withdrawal. But so it's a, But then, when you irrationally mistake that relative state as if it was the absolute, 
That's what it is. It's merely a projection from the misknowing sense of having an absolute sen absolute self within oneself that is independent from everything else. Because the ultimate reality includes all other living beings. Just if you go into a spaced out state that temporarily becomes a rush, blissfully rushed state of being free from any insensitive, unpleasant sensitivity in your body, but then eventually becomes a kind of trap where you're trapped in isolation from relational embrace of the infinite universe. And therefore you get trapped in freedom, in a state of freedom you mistake as an absolute state when it's actually only a relative state. You have to be free from freedom as well. If nirvana is somewhere else, it cannot be an absolute state. It cannot be reality because there's a boundary between it and the, and the suffering state. So therefore, it's relational. It's just another place, right? And if there's a state of being in nirvana that's separate from your being here, then it's in time and space, then it's relative and so unreliable or changeable. So Buddha, when he was being very logical, said to an audience that could kind of take it, Nirvana is reality itself and always has been, and therefore you don't actually enter it. You discover that you've always been in it. It's what you discover, you uncover. It's what you're, it's what the, it's what you're made of, actually. It is the force of infinite energy and love that you're made of. And you, and that you manage to misknow, to fail to know. <laughs> so that's failing to know yourself. So that's a good place to stop, I think, for this first session, for this single session. Page 42 of The Wisdom is Bliss. I want to thank the engineers, Adam Foison and Justin uh, Stone Diaz and um, thank all of you for attending and dedicate the merit to Manjushri and to the life purpose. So by this merit may we quickly of learning and thinking through these things may we quickly become Manjushris ourselves in order to be able to help all other beings become just the same free and equal, free and happy and equal to ourselves. Okay, so ding, that's it. Mm -hmm.